title has changed a little bit. There's now theory in there as well. And the abstract has also changed a little bit. But there's basically three things that I want to talk about. The first one is um, the relationships between multiple correspondence analysis, because this is a correspondence analysis conference, and what we call nonlinear principal component analysis. And we only will talk about a particular form of multidimensional, of uh, nonlinear component analysis. And we also review the history of that form of principal component analysis. So the second bullet shows you um, various names and definitions and keywords associated with that form of principal component analysis. And since I'm talking about a lot of things, I may run out of time. But we'll see how that goes. I'll try to aim for 40 minutes. So uh, let's start. And um, we'll start by saying a little bit about linear principal component analysis, because presumably everybody knows what that is, but the history is not entirely clear. Um, linear principal component analysis, or principal component analysis, is often attributed to Hotelling, 1933, a long article in the Journal of Educational St Psychology. Uh, but that is almost completely incorrect. Um, the equations for the principal axis or the, of quadratic forms and surfaces in various forms were already known from classical analytic geometry, notably from work by Cauchy and Jacobi around uh, 1850. And um, the principal component analysis as a technique was introduced by the uh, English statisticians associated with the Galton Laboratory, starting with Galton himself in Natural Inheritance, where he draws the principal axis of the correlation, ellipsoid. And uh, this was generalized to more than two dimensions by Pearson in a famous paper of 1901. And there is a first published application of principal component analysis as statistical data analysis techniques technique. In uh, McDonald 1902, which is a long paper in Biometrica, where um, seven physical traits of 3,000 criminals are investigated using principal component analysis. It's also the first paper with a real correlation matrix in it. So if you're interested in that. This discussion, there's a nice historical discussion in um, in Bird's paper from 1949, um, if you can find it. Bird is not very reliable if he's talking about his own contributions, but if he's talking about other people's contributions, um, he's pretty good. So that's a, a useful reference, I think. Uh, Hotelling did introduce principal component analysis following the now familiar route of making successive orthogonal linear combinations with maximum variance. And then the second combination should be orthogonal to the first one, and so on. And he also proposed an algorithm, which actually had been proposed a couple of years earlier by von Mises, uh, who's famous for many different things. But among other things, when he was still in Germany, he uh, invented the power method, basically, uh, and uh, published it uh, in a book with uh, Bolasa Geiringer. Uh, and uh, Ho Hotelling doesn't, doesn't refer to that book. He probably didn't know about it. But it's obviously earlier than 1933. So there's, that's one way to introduce principal component analysis, linear combinations of the variables with optimal properties. The other way to do it is to use the correlation ellipsoid and to look for the principal axis, which is the Galtonian way of looking at principal component analysis. Pearson, in his 1901 paper, formulated the problem. If you sort of look through the horrible notation that people used around that time, um, in finding low dimensional subspaces, lines and planes, of best least squares fit to a cloud of points, and then to connect that solution to the principal axis of the correlation ellipsoid. If you translate it to modern notation, 
that means that he's minimizing that sum of squares there. I'm using bold as a skew for sum of squares. And the sum of squares is basically to approximate a matrix Y of data by the uh, scalar products of a matrix X of scores and a matrix B of loadings. So it's a low rank approximation to a given matrix of, of data. And uh, for R is 1, that gives you the best, best line in the Pearson sense. For R is 2, the best plane, and so on. So this is perfectly normal, modern way to describe principal component analysis. And the first time that it occurs in this particular form and is suggested as a data analysis technique is in the Pearson 1901 paper. So let's now look a little bit at the history of correspondence analysis. Um, and again, we go back, um, not necessarily as far as we possibly can, but we'll go back to the origins of statistics, at least. Um, simple correspondence analysis of a bivariate frequency table was first discussed in a fairly rudimentary form, and you really have to uh, spend some time deciphering it by Pearson 1905 because he was looking for transformations of the margins of a uh, frequency table, cross table, that linearize the regressions. And he was showing in particular that the correlation coefficient doesn't change for small changes in the scoring of the marginals if the regressions are linear. And if you translate that into, into equations, you get the stationary equations for correspondence analysis. So although he did not propose correspondence analysis as a data analysis technique, he did have the equations. And there's some sort of fairly extensive discussion of that in the paper that I'm referring in that same paragraph over there, which is uh, uh, an old paper in Statistica Neerlandica. So Pearson's approach was taken, over, taken up by Hirschfeld, who later changed his name to Hartley when he had immigrated to the United States. Uh, but uh, when he was still in Germany, he published a paper in the Proceedings of Cambridge in 1935, where he, pres he presented the technique far more rigorously and far more completely than Pearson had done it. And uh, he used it uh, for uh, maximizing correlation, so give scores to the rows and the columns of the table so that the correlation is as large as possible. And then you get stationary equations. They have multiple solutions, and the multiple solutions are the eigenvalues of, uh, or the singular values of the correspondence analysis. And the equations are the same stationary equations as correspondence analysis. And he also used it to decompose contingency to show that the sum of the squares of the, uh, correlate of the, of the uh, stationary values is equal to the chi-square of the table. This approach was later adopted by Gabelein and by Renyi and his students in their study of maximal correlation. So there's also some confusion about uh, this paper in the first bullet. It's not a paper, it's a piece of a book. There's a 1938 edition of, uh, of Statistical Methods for Research Workers, and also in later editions. Fisher discusses uh, a scoring method for categorical variables as well. And um, if you look at it a little bit more in detail, it's not really correspondence analysis. It's actually a little f a form of canonical correspondence analysis, a special case, because there's regression restrictions on the, on the weights. And, uh, uh, it's, but it's very close to correspondence analysis, of course. Symmetric CA, which is not symmetric CA, as has been talked about in this conference, but basically symmetric CA here means CA without restrictions. Th those were discussed uh, in, uh, in detail by Fisher 1940, which is precision of discriminant functions. And they were applied by his co-worker Maung, who is uh, Burmese, I think. Yeah and uh, cannot be found anywhere else in the late, later literature, so that's probably his only published work. Two large papers in which he reanalyzes the uh, hair color, eye color 
data of uh, Tocher uh, that were collected in 1908 or something like that. So um, that's the um, uh, Fisher correspondence analysis publication. And then, of course, in the early 60s, which is why we're here, the chi-square metric that related uh, correspondence analysis to metric multidimensional scaling and that had an emphasis on geometry and on plotting was introduced by Benzikri. And I have a original copy of the thesis of, uh, of Cordier, which I cherish, of course, um, 1965. So that's um, correspondence analysis in the start of, the, let's say, the French school. Now, multiple correspondence analysis, which sort of combines aspects of correspondence analysis with aspects of principal component analysis, and which can be linked in various ways to what I call nonlinear principal component analysis. So the first origin are different weighting schemes to combine quantitative variables to an index that optimizes some variance-based discrimination of homogeneity criterion. Those were proposed in the late 30s by Horst, Edgerton, and Colby, and by Wilkes, who all sort of took their inspiration from Hotelling's paper, because the solution in all cases was the first principal component analysis of a data matrix, the first, the left, the left singular vector, as it were. I have the same idea, and that's where it becomes more interesting, was presented in a seminal paper by Goodman, 1941, quantification of a class of attributes. It's not a paper, it's a chapter in a book edited by Paul Horst that presents for the first time the equations defining multiple correspondence analysis. And it does it in a sort of a final, definite, nothing to add way. Uh, it's surprisingly mature and modern and anybody using multiple correspondence analysis should read that paper, I think, 1941. It's uh, a long time ago, but it's still uh, very readable and very relevant. He presents the equations both in terms of a row eigen problem, a column eigen problem, and a singular value problem. A row eigen value problem for the scores, a column eigen value problem for the weights, or the category quantifications, as Griffey would say. Griffey, by the way, is in the lower right-hand corner. And uh, as a singular value problem where you jointly compute the scores and the weights. And in the paper, there's uh, extensive discussion of uh, what's later became to be called the codage disjonctive complet, as well as the tableau de Burt. And he points out the connections with the chi-square metric as well. One thing that's um, different from uh, later presentations of correspondence analysis or multiple correspondence analysis is that there's no geometry in the paper, no pictures, and the emphasis on constructing a single scale, one-dimensional solutions. And Goodman explicitly warns against extracting and using additional eigenvalues because he says they are, they introduce complications, they're not simply related to uh, the properties of the data and uh, what he probably had in mind was the horseshoe effect. Uh, Kayo says that I can't use the word horseshoe, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, so the Goodman effect. So Goodman uh, did more work on uh, correspondence analysis and multiple correspondence analysis after this. And uh, some of it is well known, some of it is a bit hidden. But uh, there's a 1946 paper in which he applies um, his methods, the variance ratio, eigenvalue methods, to paired comparisons and rank order. And there's a 1950 chapter in the book by Stauffer in which he extends his analysis to uh, scalable binary items, and where he famously discovers these uh, orthogonal polynomial type of eigenvectors that uh, mathematicians had already been talking about for quite a while. Then in the 50s and 60s, Hayashi introduced the quantification techniques of Goodman in Japan, where they were widely disseminated through the work of Nishisato, and various extensions and variations were added by Japanese schools. So there was a distinct group 
in Japan around the end uh, in statistical mathematics that was working on these uh, extensions as well. And then there was something like a Dutch school, to uh, use a phrase, um, starting in 68, multiple correspondence analysis was studied as a form of metric multidimensional scaling by De Leo, initially by De Leo alone, but later on we were joined by a lot of people. Although the equations defining multiple correspondence analysis were the same as those defining principal component analysis, I mean they're all eigenvalue or singular value problems, the relationship between the two remain problematic and those problems are compounded by the horseshoes or the effect Goodman artificial curvilinear relationship between successive dimensions, eigenvectors. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, for now, let's talk about nonlinear principal component analysis and what we mean by that. And principal components can be made and has been made nonlinear in various ways. And there's uh, three sort of important avenues, approaches, and I'm basically only going to talk about the third one. The first one is that uh, in the hoteling way you can make linear combinations of variables that have optimal properties, as large a variance as possible, for instance. But you could also make nonlinear combinations of variables that have optimal properties, where nonlinear means some class of nonlinear functions uh, that you can choose from. And that's um, a viable approach. Not been much work on that, uh, but it's um, to some extent, some of it comes back in item response theory and uh, uh, could discuss it in that context. The second approach is that you find nonlinear combinations of components that are close to the observed variable, so that the nonlinearity is not in the combination rule of the variables, but it's in the combination rule of the components. And that generalizes the reduced rank approach of Pearson. And then third, you could look for transformation of the variables that optimize the linear PCA fit. So you stay as close as possible to linear principal component analysis, but you allow for transformations of the variables that are defined in some sort of optimal way. And that's the way, that's the form of nonlinear principal component analysis that I'll emphasize because most work has been done on that one. That's known as the optimal scaling approach, term of Daryl Bock around 1960. First approach hasn't been studied much, already said that, although there's some relation to that. The second approach is currently popular, so that's transforming the components nonlinearly. Currently popular in computer science as nonlinear dimension reduction. I'm currently working on a polynomial version of principal component analysis and factor analysis, but there's no unified theory yet. There's not as much theory available as there is for the, for the optimal scaling version. And the papers in computer science are usually of the form, well, we could also do this, uh, which basically means uh, they don't really have a long uh, history. I mean, somebody does something, presents at a conference, writes a thesis, and then the technique disappears and it's never heard of again. So there's a lot of those around. The third approach preserves many of the properties of linear principal component analysis and can be connected with multiple correspondence analysis as well. We shall follow its history and discuss the main results. So the first, uh, again, the first contribution perhaps to this technique is Goodman again, who observed in 1959 that if we require that the regression between monotonically transformed variables are linear, all the bivariate regressions, then the transformations are uniquely defined. In general, however, you can't really expect that to be exactly the case. You cannot find transformations that linearize all the bivariate regressions. So you need approximations. The approximations are usually based on that loss function over there, sum of squares of y minus xb prime. And uh, the difference with uh, classical linear principal component analysis is that you do not only minimize over x and b, scores and loadings, but you also minimize over the transformations of the columns of y. 
and the transformations are defined column-wise and belong to some restricted class of functions, monotone, steps, polynomials, splines. Of course, if you give too much freedom to the transformations, then uh, you can always make the fit trivially equal to zero. So there's a balance there. You would like to allow for general transformations because you want flexibility, but if you're too general, you get triviality. And uh, that balance is really important in most forms of optimal scaling and non-metric scaling. The algorithms used are usually of the alternating least squares type, which is very natural in this case, where your optimal transformation and low rank matrix approximation are alternated, ping pong against until you have convergence. So the low rank approximation is the classical linear singular value decomposition problem. The optimal transformation phase is transforming each variable at a time. Once you've transformed, you approximate. Once you have approximated, you find new transformations and so on until you converge. It's almost by definition a convergent algorithm because you have a decreasing sequence of loss function values that is bounded below. So here's uh, the history of programs to do this. And usually programs are associated with acronyms and they're associated with particular laboratories or groups of individuals working together. So we'll go over those again as well. The first uh, program was uh, Shepard and Kruskal, monotone regression machinery of non-metric multidimensional scaling to construct the first principal component analysis with optimal scaling program around 1962. Uh, that's what they say. The paper describing the technique was not published until 1975. But uh, it's pretty reliable because uh, the Shepard programs were actually around 1962 and it's a small extension of the stuff that they were doing at the time. Around 1970, various versions of principal component analysis with optimal scaling, which is the same thing in my terminology as nonlinear principal component analysis, were developed by Lingos and Roskam, Michigan and Nijmegen. And in 1973, uh, De Leo, Jong, and Takana started the ELSOS project, which resus resulted, among many other things, in the Principals algorithm, which was published in 78, and in the PrintQual module in SAS, which I think is still floating around somewhere in the SAS system, if you're so inclined. And then in 1980, De Leo, with uh, a bunch of other people, started the GIFI project, which resulted in Prinkles and in the SPSS version, CAT PCA, and in the R package, HOMALS, which was fairly recently published in the Journal of Statistical Software. That's a very comprehensive package. It doesn't just do principal component analysis. It does the whole GIFI system. But uh, among other things, it does the principal component analysis. 83, Winsberg and Ramsey uh, published a version using monotone splines, eye splines. And in 1987, Robert Koyak, who used the ACE smoothing methodology of Bryman and Friedman, introduced ND rays, which I think is also in R in a package, uh, uses uh, smoothers instead of uh, regression, and uh, gives an alternative way to do it, the nonlinear principal components analysis. So the GIFI project followed the ALSOS project, and it has as its explicit goals, maybe it still has as its explicit goals, to unify a large class of multivariate analysis methods by combining a single loss function, parameter constraints, and ALS algorithms. And if you list those things, you can clearly see the influence of multidimensional scaling methodology. Single loss function, that was the big, uh, the big contribution of Joe Kroskal to, uh, to psychometric or computational data analysis. Parameter constraints, within that loss function, you can have various constraints on the parameters and introduce different models in that particular way. And ALS algorithms, which came in through the ALSOS project. 
The second goal that Griffey had was to give a very general definition of component analysis to be called homogeneity analysis that would cover correspondence analysis, multiple correspondence analysis, linear principal component analysis, nonlinear principal component analysis, regression discriminant analysis, and home canonical analysis. So these are all things that you can do with the Holmos package in R, for instance. And write code and analyze examples for homogeneity analysis. That was the third objective. So let's talk a little bit about um, the actual way in which Griffey implements these objectives. So this is the basic Griffey loss function. It looks very simple, sum of squares. And uh, there's a bunch of uh, matrices uh, in, that, uh, in that loss function. One thing you certainly want in your loss function is some representation of the data, of course. And the data here are represented by uh, G matrices GJ, which are coded as indicator matrices, that's tableau disjunctif complet, or dummies. Alternatively, GJ can also be a B-spline basis, and GJ can have zero rows for missing data. Uh, X is an N by P matrix of object scores, satisfying the normalization conditions X prime X is equal to 1. And YJ are KJ times P matrices of category quantification. So variable J, there's one term in the summation for each variable. Variable J has KJ categories, where KJ can be any number from 2 to, uh, to N number of observations. And there can, in addition, be rank and level and additivity constraints on the YJ. So that's where the constraints come in and where different techniques can be implemented by using those constraints. And this is the basic Griffey algorithm. You start with, uh, well, it doesn't really matter where you start, but let's suppose that you start with some uh, initial estimates of the category quantifications, the weights, the YJ. Then you compute the new XK by uh, orthogonalizing the sum of the induced scores. And then you make a new Y, a new set of category quantifications by projecting Y hat, and I'll tell you what Y hat is in a moment, projecting Y hat on the constraints. So the notation is um, exp explicitly made there in those five bullets. Superscript K between parentheses is used for iterations. ORT is any orthogonalization method, can be QR or Gram Schmidt or the singular value decomposition. DJ are the marginals of variable J, the inner product, cross product of GJ with itself. And Y hat are the category centroids. So that's actually one of the principe baricentric that you find there. The optimal weights for given object scores are just the centroids of the individuals that are sitting in the categories. The only thing is that because we have constraints, we just use those category centroids as a starting point for the projection. But, well, I'm not supposed to point at the screen, but I'm supposed to use the mouse. There you go, mouse. So that's the projection, actually. And the constraints on Y are written in very general form as YJ must be in some set fancy YJ. So now let's look at some movies, because the topic now is star plots. I'm not sure if this is going to work, but we can try. Two examples. The first one is 1290 students, four variables, and we show both MCA and LCPA. And the second one is the US Senate, 100 senators, 20 votes. Variables are binary. Multiple correspondence analysis is equal to nonlinear principal component analysis. We'll talk about that in a moment. So this is um, uh, the object plot, the object scores for the 1290 students. Now I'm losing my cursor here, but I'm sure it's somewhere. Oh, there we go. Well, actually, that was a bit too fast. Try again. 
Oh, there we go. Well, let's just, uh, let's just um, briefly pause at this. I started with uh, 1,290 points, uh, 1,290 individuals. One of the variables is male, female. These are the category centroids for the male and for the female category, and every individual is connected with his or her category. So that's why these black lines are there. And the Giffey loss function is just the sum of squares of these black lines, the sum of squares of the length of these black lines. So in that sense, this is a direct picture of the Giffey loss function. And if you go to the next which I desperately try to do. Okay, well, right. So it's a bit fast, and I don't know how to make it slower, but you get the idea. There's four variables, so you have four of these pictures. And since the summation in the loss function is over variables, it's the sum of all the black lines and all the four plots that are flashing by at this moment. And this is the, this is the U.S. Senate, which is... Uh, clearly a, uh, a non-horseshoe, but a, uh, a Goodman effect uh, type of solution. You see the quadratic structure there. Republicans on the right, oh, no, in this case, Democrats on the right, Republicans on the left, and uh, there's some moderates in the middle. Moderates don't exist anymore, but uh, they existed at the time. So you see Jeffords, Shai, if you know American politics, Jeffords, Chafee, Bro, Collins, Snow, they're in the middle. And they, uh, if you look at the, at the votes, which is the next, uh, the next bunch of, uh, there you go. There's 20 of them. So you see there's very little overlap and the two groups are really separated very well. I'll do it again because it's fast enough anyway. So these are 20 different star plots as we call them. So that's, um, uh, one thing, this, this cone projection, which doesn't have to do anything with anything, but it's just I needed a first, first picture to get my movie started. This is nonlinear principal component analysis, again, of the Halo data. And you see it's sort of flashing by again. Uh, but we'll talk about the theory in a moment. So if there's no constraints in Giffey on the YJ, if they are free, then uh, homogeneity analysis is multiple correspondence analysis. So that's a really easy connection to make. Multiple correspondence analysis with uh, one of the two very centric principles. We will not discuss additivity constraints because they take us away from principal component analysis in the direction of regression and canonical analysis. See the Holmas paper and package. The Holmas paper is in uh, the 2009 or 2010 volume or one of the volumes of the Journal of Statistical Software. It's uh, De Leeuw and Mayer. A single variable has constraints. That's a def definition. We define a single variable as a variable which has constraints yj, zj, a prime. So for a single variable, the category quantifications have rank one. And in a given analysis, some variables can be single, while others can be multiple, unconstrained. And more generally, there can be rank constraints on the YJ, uh, but let's limit ourselves to either rank one or full rank. This can be combined with level constraints on the single quantification CJ, which can be numerical, polynomial, ordinal, or nominal. So there you go. This is the um, general form of nonlinear principal component analysis that's implemented in the HOMAS program or in the GIFI uh, system. You can choose for each variable you want, whether you want a single or multiple. If they're all multiple, it's multiple correspondence analysis. If they're all single, it's principal component analysis. And then you can also choose if you want your quantifications to be numerical, polynomial, ordinal, or nominal. And of course, this can be combined because you can choose it for each variable separately. So you have a basically infinite, infinite number of options available. Um, and some of them make sense and some of them won't. So if all variables are single, homogeneity analysis is nonlinear principal component analysis, that relationships follow from the form of the loss function. 
the second relationship between the two types of techniques, between multiple correspondence analysis and uh, nonlinear principal component analysis, is uh, implicit in Goodman 9041. If you transform all your variables, and let's think about categorical variables with a relatively small number of categories for convenience, if you transform all your variables to maximize the dominant eigenvalue of the correlation matrix, so that's a well-defined problem. Make transformations of your variables in such a way that the largest eigenvalue of the correlation matrix is as large as possible. Then you find both the first multiple correspondence analysis dimension and a one-dimensional nonlinear principal component analysis solution. So that's, uh, that's another relationship between the, between the two techniques. But there are deeper relations between the two. And those were developed in a series of papers by De Leeuw and co-workers starting in 1980. And their analysis also elucidates the effect with Mann. And these relations are most easily illustrated by performing a multiple correspondence analysis of a continuous standardized multivariate normal distribution, say on M variables. So you probably all know what the BERT table is, tableau de BERT. Um, it has the bivariate marginals stacked in a matrix. And you can easily imagine that if you're sampling or if you have a continuous distribution to deal with, then you still have a BERT table, but each table is infinite number of rows, infinite number of columns. You have to be a little bit careful with the notation, but you can easily sort of imagine that the matrix becomes bigger and bigger and eventually is infinitely large. And suppose the correlation matrix, the population correlation matrix of the multinormal distribution is R. And uh, given that we, uh, we define those guys up there in the first bullet, the identity matrix is R0, the R matrix itself is R1, and then uh, R2 is uh, the Hadamard square of R, which means the matrix with all the squares with the correlations in it and R3 is the uh, Hadamard third power of R, and so on. So there's an infinite number of those, increasing powers. If you do the correspondence analysis on this infinite birth table, then the eigenvalues that you will find are the M eigenvalues of, R, of Rs. So you'll find all the eigenvalues of all those matrices. And uh, the Ys are the corresponding eigenvectors of... Uh, of those matrices. So the eigenvalues of the MCA solution are the M times infinity eigenvalues. M times infinity is infinity, of course, but that, just to show you that there's M blocks of them, one coming from each of those matrices. And they're written as lambda JS. And the MCA eigenvector corresponding to lambda JS corresponds with the M functions YJLS times HS, where HS is the S normalized Hermite polynomial. And um, the MCA eigenvector consists of either of M linear transformations or of M quadratic transformations or of M cubic transformations or of M quartic transformations and so on. So they come from these correlation matrices in a systematic and ordered way. There are M linear eigenvalues, M quadratic eigenvalues, and so on. The same theory, which means that you can sort of split your eigenvalue problem into separate smaller eigenvalues of problems of order M, the same theory applies to what you'll call strained multinormal variables, U1900. There's nothing new under the sun, in which there exists differentiable, invertible transformations Vj so that the Vj, Zj are jointly multinormal. So it also applies not just to multinormal distributions, but also to any distribution that you can get from a multinormal by transforming all the mar marginals separately. And an example which is currently popular are Gaussian copulas. So the same theory also applies to Gaussian copulas. It also applies, except for the polynomial part, when separate transformation of the variables exist that linearize all bivariate regressions. That generalizes the result of Pearson 1905 that I mentioned earlier. 
Under all these scenarios, MCA solutions are NLPCA solutions, although in a slightly different form, but the correspondence is very easy to, uh, to establish. The eigenvectors come from the different correlation matrices, and you can see for each correlation matrix what type of eigenvectors they will produce. NLPCA solutions are always selected from the same power of the correlation matrix, while the MCA solutions come from all the RS simultaneously. And that's really what's not a problem, but that's what confounds the two types of solutions. The dominant eigenvalue is always lambda 1, 1, which means the dominant eigenvalue is always the largest eigenvalue of the first correlation matrix. So one dimension, and that's exactly what Goodman had in mind when he said, don't look at further eigenvalues because things may happen. And what may happen is that the second largest eigenvalue may be either the largest eigenvalue of the squared correlations, or it may be the second largest eigenvalue of the correlations themselves. There's no mathematical guarantee that it's going to be either one of the two. If, in the first case, we have a horseshoe, because the first dimension will have linear transformations and the second dimension will have quadratic transformations. In the second case, you will both have linear transformations for both variables, so you will not have a horseshoe. There's an example in the Giffey book from the multivariate normal distribution where there's no horseshoe. It's just a matter of choosing your correlation matrix in such a way that lambda 2, 1 is larger than lambda 1, 2. Joint bilinearizability occurs trivially in, in the case in which there's only two variables in which case, of course, multiple correspondence analysis is correspondence analysis. And it also uh, occurs if all the variables are binary, because if all the variables are binary, all the regressions are linear. There's some stuff about the, uh, the asymptotic distribution of the uh, quantities that you compute. I'm going to ignore that because I'm running out of time. There's also additional theory based on uh, total positivity, which I'm going to ignore because I'm running out of time. That's one reason why I printed handouts, so you can sort of uh, go back to it later. And uh, this is the chapter more, which basically means there's more that I could talk about, but that I'm not going to talk about. And um, once a couple of things that I do want to talk about briefly here, although, uh, again, time is running short. This is the aspect approach, which uh, there's another paper in Journal of Statistical Software 2010 by DeLeo and Mayer, um, which is uh, a variation of, um, of the Giffey system in which you take any function of the correlation matrix between the variables. Of course, the correlations are dependent on which scales you use, which transformations of the variables you use. And in the aspect approach and in the aspect program or the aspect package, you choose your transformation in such a way that that function that you have selected is optimized. And that function can be the first eigenvalue, the sum of the first p eigenvalues, the determinant, the log likelihood in a multinormal distrib distribution case, um, the squared multiple correlation between the first variable and the rest, uh, the canonical correlation between two subsets of the variables, any one of those functions. Choose transformations in such a way, of your variables in such a way that that particular function that you have selected, and many of them are built into the package, is optimized. And you can write your own if you want to. And it turns out that there's a very simple algorithm, not an alternating least squares algorithm, but a majorization algorithm that you can use to um, optimize that function. No matter what the function is, the same algorithm applies. And I, I heard Michel Tenenhaus's uh, talk this morning, and I think his, um, his approach is, uh, is also fits into this framework quite nicely. Generally, this constructs convergent algorithms because it's majorization algorithms, and you can actually um, uh, do these very general canonical uh, likelihood type of computations with it. So that's just something that we're working on, and that's uh, recently been officially published. Then the last thing, I have one more minute, 
is uh, instead of using least squares throughout, which is what Griffey does, we can buy th build a similar system using logit or probit log likelihoods. And that's the basic uh, loss function uh, that uh, I've been considering. This is related to, uh, to the work of Mark Toloi, for instance, as well. You have this uh, normalized logit type of function. You can also put a probit function there, but let's do the logit for the time being. The G, I, J, L are the same as they were in the Griffey system. They're indicator matrix, dummy variables. And um, the function uh, that's in there, the phi function, can be either distance or square distance or negative inner product. Uh, the theory works for all these three functions. And this emphasizes separation because, because we want the uh, object scores closest to the category quantifications if uh, G, I, J, L is equal to 1. So everybody needs to be closest to his category for each variable. And again, you use majorization to turn this into a sequence of reweighted least squares problems. And this, of course, gives very little detail, but I'm just telling you that that's something that's actually going on. It's, it's sometimes called uh, Gifi goes logistic, and uh, I'm going to stop here and uh, give it back to the chairman. <laughs>